On a network that was primarily about teen dramas and bad acting, the CW released Arrow only a year after the campy Superman prequel came to an end, and a new, much more depressing Superman story would begin. Now, I won't lie and pretend that I watched Arrow when it first came out. At the time, I was some angsty 11-year-old who was still clinging on to Disney Channel and trying to pretend that the ending of my childhood wasn't with Wizards of Waverly Place. Ah, <sighs> 2012. What a time to have been alive. But I have to give Arrow its due credit, because if that show had never happened, the Arrowverse, as it's known today, would never have come into existence, and we never would have gotten what I once considered my favorite TV show, and what is the very topic of this video. The Flash, speeding his way into our lives? The Flash is what got me into the Arrowverse, and to eventually watch Arrow, and at the time, it was what I considered the pinnacle of good television. Yes, it was drowned with melodrama and scenes where the characters would have long, soulful discussions in whatever hallway that they could find. But again, it's the CW, and at the time, that didn't really bother me. In fact, it still doesn't really bother me. I could sit down and rewatch any episode from seasons one and two of the show and have a great time. It's honestly not even that distracting, for the most part anyway. And at least in the first two seasons, this kind of drama served to forward the plot, not just for that one particular episode, but for the entire season and the show going forward. The scene where Barry confesses his love for Iris at Christmas got Iris to really start viewing Barry as more than just her friend, and in the 15th episode of the season, she confesses that she's in love with him too. The timeline, of course, gets erased, and honestly, it leads to the most... awkward altercation between two individuals that I've ever seen. But because of this, added to the fact that the newspaper byline from the future names her as Iris West Allen, Barry starts to think that maybe things will work out between the two of them. To further this narrative, there's this cliche love triangle with them and her cop boyfriend, Eddie, and this is the kind of thing that most people would simply roll their eyes at. Because love triangles are really horrible and almost never utilized properly. But this only further adds to the suspense, because Eddie is just such a likable character who a lot of people can relate to. He's not some superhero with any cool powers, or some genius scientist who can fix up some sort of high-tech ex machina device. He's just your average guy who was thrust into a world that he can't possibly pretend to understand. And he pits himself against literally impossible odds by going after the girl who's destined to be with somebody else. You don't want anything bad to happen to Eddie. You like Eddie, but you know he and Iris aren't going to work out because she's going to end up with Barry, no matter how forced or creepy it is once you think about it for more than five seconds and realize they're basically brother and sister. My point is, at the beginning of the show, it was really good. Season 1 set up a really powerful, compelling origin story for Barry Allen that was also gripping with an intriguing mystery. And if you're like me and you had never read even one DC comic before starting the show, you were just dying to know how a speedster could have existed 14 years before the particle accelerator exploded. Oh. Time, time travel. Uh, that's pretty cool. I didn't know running fast suddenly made you Doctor Who, but... The villain on the show was amazing, working really well as the perfect rival for The Flash, and given an exceptional performance by Tom Cavanaugh, who is pretty much one of the greatest actors of all time. There is also not a single character from seasons 1 and 2 that I don't like. Even most of the one-note arbitrary metahumans that are in the show for a total of one episode. Speaking of Flash villains, or rogues as they're called, seasons one and two are also blessed with the amazing actor that is Wentworth Miller, giving a phenomenal performance as Leonard Snart, aka Captain Cold, who is one of, if not the best character who has ever been on this show. Not only is he no pun intended, cool and overall charismatic, but he has so much character depth and is just so fun to watch. Every scene he's in, he steals it. I could really go on all day about how great this show used to be. In fact, I haven't even touched on the masterpiece that was season two. It wasn't quite as good as season one, but it was just such an amazing story and it had a super cool, intimidating villain. Zoom was literally hyped up as this big, scary speedster for like six episodes, and honestly, I didn't really believe them until I I saw for myself. A good tool that should always be used in storytelling is the art of show, don't tell. You can go on all day about something that you want your audience to believe, but they're never really going to unless they see for themselves. And Season 2, Episode 6 delivers on this so well. The end of the episode just shows us Zoom kicking Barry's buttocks. He's just railing on this kid, breaks his spine, drags him across the city, catches his freaking lightning bolt, and wails it at him. This fight made me lose my 
freaking mind. And as a viewer of the show, it had me genuinely concerned about how Team Flash was gonna beat Zoom. Season 2 also introduced a lot of really good characters and concepts, and overall expanded the world into this whole multiverse, leaving potential for countless new stories to be told in the future. Like I said, I could go on all day about why I love these seasons, but nobody's here to see me do that. You want to see me complain, and you're in luck, because everything from the last minute of Season 2, and basically everything afterward is hot garbage. Out of all three of the final seasons, season three was definitely the worst. I'm pretty sure it's basically universally agreed upon that season four was worse than season three, but no. I'm not going to say that this is quality television, but it's certainly better than this. As previously stated, I hadn't read a single DC comic before starting this show. I'm not going to pretend to be some Flash lore master. I've done some research on it whenever a certain character or concept will be introduced into the show, just so that I can understand the iconic references. And that's why when, at the end of Season 2, Barry went back in time to save his mom, I looked up Flashpoint. There is actually an animated Justice League film that explores Flashpoint, and I think it was really well done. I watched it in preparation for Season 3 just to sort of get a feel for what we would be in for, and yeah, I knew it wasn't going to be exactly like it was in the movie, because at the time, characters like Batman, Superman, Aquaman, and Wonder Woman, who were all major players in that movie, had never even appeared in the Arrowverse and had, at best, been alluded to. I've seen Men of Steel die and Dark Knights fall. However, I wasn't going into Season 3 expecting the Flashpoint timeline to be a cut-for-cut -cut remake of the original story. In fact, I can't even attest to the claim that the movie I watched is entirely accurate to the original story. I sort of doubt that it is. But what I did want going into Season 3 was to at least get a few episodes exploring this alternate timeline, seeing where all these different characters ended up and what life is like in Central City. Instead, we got one whole episode to this, an episode that, I'll admit, was pretty cool, and then it was done. No more Flashpoint. It's done. It's over. Go home. Pretty much the rest of Season 3 is just Team Flash having to deal with Barry's mistakes, and everybody being mad at him all the time. This would be such a cool concept if it was done right, but it's not. It's not done right. It's, it's actually what I would define as some of the worst execution in the history of ever. You get this whole lecture from Barry's dad's doppelganger, Jay Garrick, about how the timeline is like this fragile little teacup, and once you break it, you can do all you want to try to fix it, but it will never be exactly the way it was before. But this doesn't really make a whole lot of sense, and it's never explained to us why things can't go back to exactly the way they were before. If Barry goes back and stops himself from stopping the reverse Flash from killing his mom, then effectively any changes from the timeline never happened, which means absolutely nothing should be changed when Barry returns to 2016. And we're not even talking about a universe where time travel is even taken that seriously. It isn't like what you would see from the butterfly effect where one small, seemingly minuscule thing like kicking over a pebble will drastically alter the course of history. This show literally exists in the same universe as Legends of Tomorrow, where the team literally laughs in the face of the timeline and seems to give no care about being discreet while moving around in the past. Sarah wants to sleep with the Queen of France right before she's supposed to conceive the heir to the monarchy? Well, I wonder what drastic changes that will have on the timeline going forward. Oh, none? N n none at all? Seriously? Okay, fine. I'll suspend my disbelief and act like that almost definitely wouldn't have a lasting impact on the timeline, but if you're going to make me do that, then you can't also tell me that Barry very minorly changing the timeline on one occasion will cause Cisco's brother to be dead or John and Lila from Arrow going from having a daughter to a son. The only possible explanation for why I think the timeline could have changed at all is that I guess the reverse Flash could have done something, but then... I thought after killing Nora, he was supposed to get stranded in that time, which means he couldn't possibly have changed anything. Wasn't that the entire point of Thon's motivations back in Season 1? That he was trying to get back to his time? Doesn't him being able to go to the future sort of erase the events from Season 1 and 2 from ever happening anyway? Then again, I was also pretty sure that he was erased from existence, yet here we are. Time travel! I've already been talking about Season 3 for way longer than I would have liked, so I'm going to go ahead and speed this along. Mm -hmm. You get it? Because, like, 
just like speed. Let's see. I didn't like the villain for the season because he was literally the exact same thing as the last two. I know I'm not the first person to bring this up, but after two seasons of having speedster villains, it sort of became contrived and formulaic when they did it again. They also waited way too long to reveal his identity to the point where, honestly, I didn't even care who he was. I just wanted them to reveal it already and we could actually get somewhere with the plot. And of course, when they do finally reveal who Savitar is, it's just Barry Allen. From the future. Well, a time remnant of Barry, but... S still Barry. Whose idea was this? This is literally what every single person predicted. I literally refused to believe it was going to be future Barry because that would have just been so obvious. One of the most popular videos on this entire channel, actually, is a theory I put out about who Savitar was. I had initially put out a theory before that where I said that Savitar was just Barry from the future. But I decided that that was just too obvious, so in my popular video, which has over 50,000 views, I said that Savitar was Ronnie Raymond. Now, was I wrong? Obviously. Did I get heavily ridiculed for several months following that video? Absolutely. And is there any purpose for me asking all of these questions only to them immediately answer them afterward, other than to pad the runtime? Absolutely not. But my point is that I still stand by my Ronnie Raymond theory. I think that would have easily been a hundred times better than the reveal that we actually got. But honestly, making Savitar a future Barry is a pretty interesting concept. But as I keep saying throughout this video, execution is everything. If they hadn't made us wait so long to finally just tell us who Savitar was in some attempt at non-existent suspense, we could have had time to explore ideas of Barry looking at the darkness within himself, realizing that he could just as easily become the monster that Savitar was, and maybe trying to better himself and be a happier person rather than this brooding emo nightmare that we've seen throughout the season. And the episode Cause and Effect gave us a really cool concept where Barry accidentally loses his memory, which means that Savitar also loses his memory. It honestly is one of the best episodes of the season, because not only does it show us that Savitar isn't this unstoppable god as he's claimed to be, but it also gave us an example of Team Flash being creative and trying to find ways to use Barry against Savitar. I remember everything. I remember everything. But I remember everything. But the last few episodes of the seasons are the only slots available for this kind of stuff, and obviously you don't have very much time to explore these concepts because these are the episodes where you're supposed to be setting up for the finale and then having it. And all the episodes before they find out who Savitar is just feel like a boring waste of time because you know what they could have been. To end my discussion of season 3, I would like to talk about one of the few things that I do like from it. I love the episode right before the finale because it had a really cool heist premise where Barry had to steal a piece of Dominator tech from Argus, but inside Argus walls his powers are negated, so he has to figure out a way to steal it without using his super speed. This is one of the only genuinely compelling episodes of the season, and I haven't even mentioned the best part yet. We finally get Captain Cold back one more time to help Barry steal the tech. I've already talked about why I love Cold so much, and he does really great here, especially his dynamic with Barry being the sanely good guy while Barry is the ruthless, cold one who is willing to do whatever it takes. It's a really nice reversal of their traditional roles, and I like that. I like that a lot. Of course, even with this episode as great as it is, it does also bring up a complaint, which is the fact that Captain Cold left the Flash and goes and joins the Legends of Tomorrow, and then he dies. He's dead, guys, and we're never ever getting him back. Well... Mostly. Alrighty then, time to gripe about the slightly better one. Season 4 of The Flash isn't... great? For multiple reasons. To begin, it starts off by failing in the exact same way that Season 3 did. In the Season 3 finale, Jay Garrick, who was previously stuck in a Speed Force prison that was designed for Savitar, came out to help Team Flash fight against Savitar. Afterward, the Speed Force started to go nuts because it needs some speedster to be inside the prison at all times in order to be appeased. At the very end of the finale, Barry goes with this manifestation of his dead mommy and leaves the team without the Flash. Well, except for Wally, but... 
no one cares about Wally. I was really hoping that the show had learned from their mistakes when they reduced Flashpoint to one episode, and that in season four, they wouldn't immediately bring Barry back and act like nothing had ever happened. This was a chance for the rest of the characters to have to learn to keep the city safe on their own without Barry. It would give them all some much-needed fleshing out, and it would just have been nice to see something that's supposed to be this big season cliffhanger last for more than 40 minutes. But nope. Barry's out of his Speed Force prison like halfway through the first episode because science this, science that, blah, blah, blah. And by the end of the episode, he's back to his normal self, only faster. <laughs> Speaking of being faster, this segues right into one of the things that Season 4 does well, or at least what it tries to do well. As I just finished complaining about with Season 3, the main villain being a speedster three times in a row got really stale, and the show realized this, which is why they gave us Clifford DeVoe, aka The Thinker. Personally, I was really looking forward to seeing how someone without super speed could pose such an ominous threat against the fastest man alive for 23 episodes, and I was really glad that however they were going to do this, we would see Barry and all of Team Flash really having to use their brains to figure it out, rather than just run, Barry, run. And I have to give credit where credit is due, because Season 4 managed to pull off a way better non-speedster villain than we got in Season 5, but I'm getting way ahead of myself here. The main problem I was sort of having with DeVoe is the same problem that I had with Thrawn in Star Wars Rebels. If you've seen my overall review for Rebels, you already know that I thought Thrawn was just really dumbed down. He came off as this super intelligent master strategist, but his plan didn't make any sense, and almost every single episode that the Rebels would either get the upper hand on the Empire or even manage to escape, Thrawn would simply say this was all part of his plan, and then everyone in the Empire would just be like, this mother f All the lower level Imperials give Thrawn this look like this dude is literally going to be the downfall of the Empire. I don't know why the Emperor put him in charge. He's literally crazy. <laughs> But they're right! This dude is an incompetent fool who deserves to be questioned. Then again, every Imperial is on that show, and now I'm getting even more angry because I'm thinking about that show. But DeVoe suffers from the same flaw as Thrawn, only it's much worse because his hyperintelligence is supposed to be far greater than Thrawn's. He's the same guy who made Earth 2 Harrison Wells need a thinking cap just to almost match his intelligence before it ended up frying his brain and making him lose his intelligence. A fact that I'm still bitter about. I first notice flaws. DeVoe's plan all the way back in the mid-season finale, when Barry comes home to find DeVoe's dead body in his apartment, and then Captain Singh and a bunch of cops knock on the door. Barry decides it's better not to spend his life on the run, so basically just... surrenders? What the f- Did we all just forget the fact that Barry has super speed? Am I the only one who thought about this? There's literally an entire episode a few episodes later dedicated to showing us that Barry is so fast that when he's in flash time, three seconds for us is like literal hours for him. And you're telling me that Barry couldn't have found somewhere to hide the body and clean it up before the cops came in? <sighs> I just... I really hate this season. I mean... I guess this part of the plan worked out for DeVoe, even though it shouldn't have, because if Barry had used even one real brain cell, he could have easily gotten out of this situation. But whatever, we ruined Flashpoint, so now we gotta ruin the Trial of the Flash storyline too. Again, I don't really see how this works into DeVoe's plan. He acts like Barry going to prison is, like, necessary? Like it needs to happen so his plan can work, but what purpose did it really serve to further his plan? Was it a distraction while they did nothing? Literally in this entire arc, DeVoe and his wife, Marlies, do basically nothing at all. The only good explanation I can think of for why they went through all this trouble was so that Barry would team up with some of the bus metas to escape from Warden Wolf's secret holding place, and sure, I guess that's a good enough reason. I feel like it probably would have just been easier, though, to hire Amunet to buy them all and then sell them over to the DeVoe's. Maybe they just couldn't afford to buy them all, but honestly, it's not like it would have been hard for them to just kill her, since she seems to do all of her meetings with them on secluded rooftops by herself with absolutely no security. Honestly, I doubt they would have been able to do much for her against the Thinker, but not having them at all is just stupid. And speaking of Amunet, this seems like a perfect enough segue into the final thing I'll say about season four before I go into cardiac arrest. Now this is also a gripe that I had with season three, but I left it out of that rant because I was already going on way too long, and honestly it annoyed me a lot more this season. And that is the whole storyline with Killer Frost. I 
I just don't see why this is a thing at After all. After the concept was introduced to us in Season 2, I was definitely on board with Earth-1 Caitlin having ice powers, although we already knew that that wasn't going to happen because we'd been shown in an earlier episode that Caitlin was, in fact, not a metahuman. Then Flashpoint happened, and the timeline was slightly altered for some reason, and now Caitlin has ice powers, but she doesn't want anyone on the team to know about it. Okay, that's fine. I mean, if Flashpoint is going to change the timeline as we know it anyway, at least something cool can came out of it. And it didn't. It ended up making less sense as her story progressed. Like, why does having these powers mean she has to be evil? Season 4 actually did a pretty good job at balancing this out so that Caitlin was able to coexist with Killer Frost, but I'm just wondering why this was ever a problem in the first place. Just because some other universe's version of you was evil doesn't mean that you have to be too. Alright guys, let's make that today's life lesson. Just because some other universe's version of you was evil doesn't mean you have to be too. Remember that the next time you want to rob a bank. Just because your doppelganger does it, doesn't make it cool. My main problem with Caitlyn's struggle with Killer Frost this season was just that it didn't even need to exist. At the end of Season 3, Draco Malfoy basically conjures up a magic cure to erase Killer Frost after being gone for, like, one episode. Super convenient, but who cares anymore? But at that point, she was, like, this weird hybrid between the two, so she was like, Nah, Blondie, I'm not gonna take the cure because I'm all good now. But then they leave it at that, and the next time we see her in Season 4, she was working at a bar for some crime lord, none other than the aforementioned Amunet Black. We find out that the reason she's working for her is because basically Killer Frost was starting to take control of her again, so she literally went to a crime syndicate to help her control Frost rather than just go to Star Labs and get the cure. Seriously, why didn't she just go back to Team Flash the second she was having problems? Was it because she was mad at them? Even if that's the case, I seriously don't think she's dumb enough to think turning to a powerful criminal is a better alternative. Later on in the season, after Caitlyn and Killer Frost have finally learned to coexist, Frost is just gone. Erased. All for naught. Or at least so I was hoping, but then we get a vibe from Cisco, and we find out that somehow she's always had these ice powers, ever since she was a little kitty, and now her dad, who is supposed to be dead, has something to do with it, so oh boy, we're definitely going to continue this storyline. I will say, though, that this does leave a lot of intrigue, and could have potentially handled it in a way that was interesting, leaving it up to Season 5 to figure out how to make it all work. So with all my gripes against Season 4 out of the way, this seems like a good time to finally start talking about about The Flash Season 5. The very biggest issue that I had with this season was the villain, and he was a villain that I was definitely already skeptical about going into the first episode. Cicada. Now, I immediately saw Cicada and thought, yeah, there's no way this guy would be nearly strong enough to pose a threat for Team Flash the entire season, and I hate to say it, but I was absolutely correct. They kept having to have these situations where Cicada would get away, despite the fact that Team Flash should easily have been able to catch him pretty much every time. Then, almost toward the end of the season, he gets killed off and replaced by another Cicada from the future, and even with both of them, it's honestly a miracle they were able to pull off 22 episodes, but even even then, they had to have a lot of side episodes about the Reverse Flash, who was back this season. Because even with two Cicadas, he was necessary in order to bring this mess home. Cicada would have worked a lot better as the mid-season villain like Dr. Alchemy before eventually setting up a much more powerful Big Bad. I honestly was hoping that in episode 8 of the season, right before the big crossover that would be the winter finale for all Arrowverse shows, that they would just defeat Cicada then and there, and the rest of the season could have been about Reverse Flash or literally anyone else. And honestly, they should have. Have, there is no good excuse for the fact that they weren't able to beat him. They finally managed to get Cicada's dagger, which had been rendering them powerless, and Cisco breached it away. And maybe I'm being a little harsh on Cisco because it isn't like he could really have predicted that Cicada would be able to summon his dagger from space. But then again, yes, he could have predicted that. I predicted that, and I'm definitely not smarter than Cisco. At the very least, there was no reason why he couldn't have breached it to any other universe just for safekeeping. That way, Cicada wouldn't have been able to summon it, and they would have easily defeated him. If not Reverse Flash, you know who would have made a really interesting primary antagonist for the season? Caitlyn's father. So we eventually find out that he basically has his own icy alter ego, and this guy is also evil for no reason. Considering the Killer Frost plotline took the back burner for two seasons leading up up to season 5, they could have finally made it the primary focus for the season now that the storyline was actually starting to get good. Instead, however, the Killer Frost arc has like two or three episodes dedicated to it this season, and then her dad is a good guy again, and they all live happily ever after. Now, a lot of people definitely were not a fan of Nora this season, myself and my mom, who watches the show with me, included. However, if you clicked on this video expecting me to go on a tangent about how Nora sucks and I hate Nora, then frankly, you've wasted your time.
Sorry. The only problem that I had with Nora was just her attitude. It seems to me like every episode she learns the exact same lesson as in the previous about how she needs to stop being so impulsive. She also acts like this little kid, and every time Barry tells her how to do something, she argues and acts like she knows better. Now, this is the kind of behavior that you honestly should expect from your child, and it's something that I definitely would have been fine with. If she was a child. She's a grown woman, the same age as her parents in this time. She shouldn't be acting like a teenager or even a ten-year-old who cries every time she doesn't get her way. And I could easily justify her taking Eobard as her mentor in 2049, just because he was the only speedster in that time who could teach her how to use her powers, and because she didn't know that he killed Barry's mom. However, as soon as she finds out what he did, she should have gone back to 2049 and told Thon to go to hell. It honestly isn't like she even needed him, since she had Barry as a mentor. And I honestly couldn't see myself ever working with the man who killed my grandma. Honestly, my main problem with Nora, though, isn't even with Nora herself. It's Iris. She honestly annoys me so much, and has continued to do so throughout the show from season 3 onward. Coincidence? I think not! Now, I could go on a whole rant about why I hate Iris, but honestly, that dead horse has been beaten so many times, and this video is going on way longer than I would like it to. Plus, I think that this one clip right here basically sums it up perfectly. She was working with Dawn?! That doesn't bother you. No, it doesn't. Maybe if he killed your mother in front of you, feel differently. I really don't think I need to explain how wrong this is of her, but if I do, then there's a part later in the scene that basically sums up my thoughts. You know, if this were anybody else, you'd back me. But because it's Nora, because it's our daughter, the person who finally stopped hating you, you refuse to see how dangerous this is. You talk about making decisions based on emotion. Look in the mirror. All in all, this show just has me feeling really tired. I still want to give it a chance. I'm still hoping that season 6 will be a return to form, but honestly, I just don't have much faith in this show. The only reason I'm excited about season 6 is for Crisis on Infinite Earths, which isn't even because of the Flash, it's actually for Arrow and how this crossover will effectively be the end of the show and Oliver Queen's story. Frankly, the fact that the reason I'm hyped for Crisis isn't even because of the Flash is just wrong. This is his story. In the comics, this is the one where Barry Allen died, and unlike most superhero deaths, he stayed that way until the next reboot. As we saw at the end of the finale, this is going to be when Barry vanished is, what the show has been building toward literally since episode one, and the only reason I'm excited is because of Arrow. I'm... I'm, I'm, stick, I'm sick to my stomach. Well guys, there you have it. This is why I hated The Flash season 3, 4, and 5. I know most people agree that these are the weaker links on the show, but I'm curious to know what you think, so go ahead and leave a comment below, and I'll be sure to check it out. If you want to see more content from your friendly neighborhood, Dark Lord of the Sith, then be sure to subscribe and turn on the notification bell, and give this video a like while you're down there. As always, thanks for watching, and I will see you all next time.